In our last video, we were looking over the sampling distribution of sample proportions. Namely, what we did was we took a sample of five coin tosses, and we recorded the number of heads, and then we imagined doing that same sample of size five over and over and over again. And we saw that when we do that, each sample will create its own p hat, its own sample proportion for heads, and then we'll be able to create a distribution from that, like a histogram and a table and all of those things. We'll be able to see the shape and then maybe the center and spread for that distribution. So we want to kind of take that a little bit further and more codify what that distribution will look like in the central limit theorem for proportions. So you suppose that you're going to take a sample of size n from a population with a population proportion p. So in our example, we were taking samples of size 5 from a population that had a population proportion of 0.5 because a half of the time you expect to get a heads. And if you have the following conditions met, um, condition 1, that each observation is random, condition 2, that the observations are independent of each other, and then there's that same issue we ran into in 8.1, which is if the sample is collected without replacement, then the population must be at least 20 times larger than the sample size. And condition 3, that the distribution of the sample proportions will be normal. Now the way to make that happen is to make it so that your n is large enough so that this n times p times 1 minus p will in fact be greater than 10 like you would like. Now it's interesting to note that that is not the same requirement as in section 8.1. In 8.1, to be large enough, quote unquote, just meant that n had to be greater than or equal to 30. But that doesn't make a lot of sense for proportions because let's say you're going to call up people and ask them about their uh, presidential approval. So we do this on a regular basis, news organizations do this. And it would make no sense for them to call 30 people. You'd like them to call 300 people, 3,000 people. Right, because you need this n times p times 1 minus p to be greater than or equal to a 10 in order for the distribution to be approximately normal. All right, if you have those three conditions met, then the following is true. You have a shape that is approximately normal. Well, of course, because that was condition 3. Then you'll have a center, which is the mean of your p hats. So if you take the average of all your p hats, you'll have p, the proportion. So, for example, if I go back here, I see that I have, you know, 1 at 0, 4 at 0 0.2, 5 at 0 0.4, and so on. But if I average them all out, I should be right around 0.5 for my mean. Right? The mean of all of these different proportions, all these different p hats, should be p, which is the population proportion, which is 0.5. And the spread is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of sample proportions. And that's a lot of words to say, so they changed it up to standard error. Right? Standard error is the easier name for the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of sample proportions. So it's the standard error of the proportion, which is SE of p hat, p hat being your sample proportion. And that's abbreviated with sigma p hat, and it has a huge formula right here. So that is the p, or excuse me, square root of p times 1 minus p, all divided by n. So that is the standard error for p hat. Very large and in charge. Now, we often don't know p, um, especially in a couple of our chapters. We won't have a value for p, I believe especially in chapter 9, that'll be the case. So if that happens, then you're stuck using p hat, which is a slightly weaker version. So in that case, we abbreviate it as p hat. All right, so let's look at the conditions again of, of this formula. So we have the whole condition one. Condition one says that it has to be normal, can, or it's be random right here. Okay, well, why is that important? Well, it's the same reason it was important as in section 8.1. You have to have random, otherwise the whole thing is biased and you've got big, big, big problems. There. So I basically wrote the exact same thing that I wrote back in chapter section 8.1, which is if the sample's not random, then it'll be biased and all the conclusions we would draw would, um, and the mathematical operations we would perform would be invalid and worthless. That's what section 1.5 was about and that would be a big, big problem for us. 
also all of the um, normal CDF, binomial, everything's built off of, these are actually built from binomial formulas from section 6.2. Might not seem like it, but it is. So if you can't have um, random, then you can't use binomial, and then these formulas would no longer hold to true. So those that would also be a big, big problem for us. So condition number one, being random, is a really important thing. But again, it's such a big, big problem that almost always we assume that we have it. Matter of fact, always, always in this course, we will assume we have it. Now, independence is a big deal um, because, well, for the similar reasons, right? You don't want to bias your sample and stuff like that. But also because these probabilities, these formulas right here, particularly for standard error, are, and center are built off of the binomial distribution. And if you don't have the binomial distribution, um, which one of the requirements of binomial is that it's independent, if you don't have independence, then you don't have those formulas. So the formulas for the mean, um, which is mu sub p hat, and standard error of p hat are both derived from the binomial distribution, section 6.2. In particular, the formulas we had for the mean and standard deviation um, for the binomial distribution in that section, that's where these two formulas come from. There's a little bit more modification, but that's where they come from. And if you don't have independent, then you don't have the binomial distribution, in which case those formulas would be invalid. All right, so that would be a big problem. So remember, though, that we only worry about dependence when we have sampling without replacement. If we're sampling with replacement, we automatically have if we are sampling with replacement, then we assume independence. Assume independence. So dice and um, coins, that kind of thing. You assume that those are always independent, which is a pretty safe assumption most of the time, as long as it's random. Or excuse me, as long as the selection of the sample is random. So we've considered condition one and condition two right here. So now let's look at condition three. I'm gonna underline these just to make them a little bit easier. So condition three is the n must be large enough discussion. So because of conditions one and two, we assume that we have the binomial distribution. And then let's look about at look at the binomial distribution again and normality. So consider the probability of success is 0.2. If you remember, this is equal to the probability of success in that section. And it's 0 0.2. And then look at what happens to that distribution as I let n, the sample size, get larger and larger and larger. You'll notice that as n increases, so in this top left corner graph, n is equal to only 15. And you can see it's quite skewed right. But as n becomes 30, it's still got a little bit of a tail. It's a little hard to see, but it's there. And then as n becomes 70, the distribution becomes effectively normal. So as n gets larger and larger, then the, the shape of the distribution becomes normal. And that's what we mean when we look at condition 3, and it says the sample size must be large enough. Large enough to make it so that that binomial distribution has a normal shape. And that will happen when n times p times 1 minus p is greater than or equal to 10. So I wrote that up. We notice how the last distribution is where n is equal to 70 is normal shaped. And that means, or that leads us to believe that if n is large enough, and that's the key word, large enough, whatever that means, then the binomial distribution becomes more and more normal shaped. In other words, it becomes normal. Now the question is, what is large enough? Well, large enough, here, let me just put it this way, becomes normal. We can suppose that the larger the n value, the more normal and smaller spread the curve will have, right? We learned that in the central limit theorem up here, right? If you have n, oops, n larger, sorry, I'm in the wrong one. If you have n larger, that means that 
that not only does the curve become normal, but it makes it so that there is less and less spread. And you can see that in the central limit theorem right here. It's saying in the spread portion, it lets you know that since n is in the denominator, the larger your n value is going to be, the less spread you're going to have, but it will definitely be normal. And the larger your n is, the more normal the shape is going to be. All right, so that's what this is saying. So large enough will be n times p times 1 minus p is greater than 10, which in fact for 70 it is. If you put 70 in for n, p is 0.2, 1 minus p is 1 minus 0.2, or 0.8. Oops, my number lock went off. So 1 minus 0.2. There we go. Then that will be 11.2 with a calculator, which is in fact greater than 10. And so therefore we have a normal shape, or n large enough to ensure normal shape. n being our sample size, so lowercase n. And that's what this is. This is the rule of thumb. So the rule of thumb says that if n is large enough, if n, so that n times p times 1 minus p is greater than 10, then if that's the case, then you have a large enough sample to guarantee normal. And we need that for chapters 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Uh, we will use that, that fact a lot. And that was first discovered by um, James Bernoulli and Abraham de Moivre. So they discovered that if n was large enough, that their binomial distributions that they had already figured out were fitting better and better and better into this normal curve. The term normal curve was not coined for a very long time. But suffice to say that that discrete distribution, see the bars in there, those little um, rectangles, they are approaching and getting closer and closer to that curve. Right? So as n increases, your binomial distribution gets closer and closer to that normal distribution. And that's what I wrote right here. So that discrete distribution is being changed into an approximately continuous normal distribution. And this is one of the ways that we can make that leap from discrete variables to continuous variables. For things like money, where there's lots of decimal places, it's often easier just to treat it like it's a continuous variable. And it's not alone in that. Lots of things will be treated with the normal curve that Bernoulli and de Moivre discovered, and Pearson, Carl Pearson, the guy that invented the correlation coefficient from chapter 4, he's the one that first called it normal, quote unquote. And in case you're interested, this is the function for it, believe it or not. So you would have to type that into a calculator to get it to graph that lovely normal curve that you know and love.